Sarah Holder, member at Harvest Christian Center for about two or three years, three years now. Um, and I was asked to share what Jesus means to me. And I thought about this and knowing that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, that's what he is to me. He's the beginning of my day. He's the first person I talk to when I wake up. And he's the last person I talk to before I fall asleep. But there's more. He's not just the Alpha and Omega. To me, he's everything in between. Everything. He's the voice that reminds me that I'm okay. That I'm doing a good job. He's the voice that guides me to be a good wife and a better mom. Jesus is to me absolutely everything. I was raised in a Pentecostal home, but there's a difference between being taught to believe and actually having the encounter yourself. And I've had that encounter here in this very building. I had been sick, very sick. Scarlet Tina was quarantined. For 10 days, my family sat in the house, which doesn't seem like nothing anymore because we've been doing this already, but it was because I was sick. And when we got to go to church again, I was covered by the Holy Spirit, absolutely covered. In this very, very building, I started praying for my grandma and was overtaken by the Holy Spirit in tongues at nine years old. It was beautiful. It was everything. And I looked out the window and seen a dove in the parking lot. And my dad seen the same dove. And nobody else seen it. So I say Jesus is everything because he's manifest so much in my life that there's no other explanation. There's no explanation why I survived that childhood illness as a child and as an adult. And the car accident that cracked my back. Jesus is everything. He brought me off that hill and he has been everything. Hi, I am Rebecca Woody. I am Pastor Mark and Wendy's daughter and they have asked me to do my version of what Jesus means to me. I don't have too much of a testimony. Uh, I've been watching and helping record the last a bunch of them so I know that a lot of them are giving their testimony. I don't have too much of one because I've been, I've known Jesus my whole life. My dad's been a pastor since before I was born. So I don't have too much of a testimony. I've just, I've known Jesus, but he is my everything. He is my comforter. He is there for me. Even when I feel like the world is crashing down around me, he is magnificent. He is omnipresent. He is a thousand things and he is my comforter and my savior. And that's, that's really all I got. So, uh. Thank you guys. Hello, my name is Irma Fagum and, and Pastor Wendy asked me to do another segment on this, why we love Jesus. And so this is what I feel like, like God laid on my heart. Uh, um, I'm kind of having trouble getting started this morning, so bear with me while I get my, get my mind together here. <laughs> but why do I love Jesus? And I was thinking about that. I thought about it when other people were sharing that. And what would I say if, if it was my turn? And nothing really came to me. And uh, then as I started really thinking about it, and I thought, I love Jesus because, and I'm going to get emotional, <laughs> because he first loved me. He loved me first before I even knew him. And I just want to start from the beginning because... Um, Jesus loved, again, he loved me before I even knew him. In Ephesians 1, 4, it says, He has chosen us before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So before God and Jesus even formed the earth, before he made the sun and the moon and the stars, uh, he knew us, every one of us. I kept the thinking of the earth and the billions and billions of people that have lived on this earth. But it says that he knew us and he knew me. That makes it personal. He knew me. He knew I would be here. He knew that I would serve him, that I would love him all my life. And so anyway, it says he chose us too. That's another thing. 
that we are chosen. Um, John 15, 16 says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go forth and bring fruit. And so uh, we're chosen. I mean, how special. It's like, uh, you know, when we go to choose a pet or an animal, we pick out that special one, but, but that God chose us. Jesus chose us. And, and uh, my husband was a singer, and he sang this old gospel song about he chose me. And that just means a lot, that, that I am special, that God loves me for what, what I have in me, that we're all different God made us all different. Thank God we're not <laughs> we're not all the same. But that He has chosen us from the foundation of the earth. That that He knew us and He wanted a relationship with us. That that uh, He made the angels, but they don't worship Him. Jesus didn't die for the angels. He died for us, and He wants us to be able to communicate with Him and tell Him how much we love Him, and and to be there and, and want a relationship with Him. And so that's why. Uh, why he chose people. He chose us. He created us in his own image. We are made in the image of God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And he wants to have a relationship with us. And it says in Isaiah 43, 1 and 2, it says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. And I've shared this before about God knows our name. Each and every one of you, God knows your name. And I can't help but, you know, when, when Adam named all the animals, each one had a special meaning. And that maybe he put it in our parents' hearts to name us what we, what we are named because that is special. Our name has a meaning to God, you know, and maybe not to us. And maybe you wish sometimes you had a different name because <laughs> some of us do. <laughs> but uh, anyway, but uh, I had looked, my, looked up the name Irma one time and it meant strong. And sometimes I don't feel very strong, but but uh, I've lived 84 years and gone through a lot, and and so I've had to be strong to, to still be here anyway. And that God protects us, uh, that Jesus is there all the time, that he has just protected me over and over and over and over again, that times that I don't even know about, that he's been there and he's protected me. And I just wanted to share a couple of times uh, probably 20 years ago, I started getting sick and having so much pain and, and come to find out I had a staph infection in my chest and it got into my bones and I had staphylococcal pneumonia in both lungs and was so sick. Oh, I was so sick and had so much pain and I ended up in St. Vincent's Hospital in Portland and, and on IVs and surgery. They took out two and a half inches of my uh, clavicle and my sternum because of and a staph infection had gone into them and, and IVs and everything. And this went on for, for three months. But God was there with me. He was there and he spared my life. He had a reason for me being here. And then I had a pain in my right side later. And, and uh, I thought, well, I'll just go have it checked out. And, and so when they checked in, uh, the uh, right ovary was <laughs> uh, looking a little bit different and had a good good blood supply and so they went ahead and did surgery they never could find any cancer but I'm just sure that that it was, that's what was developing if I hadn't have had it out so God gave me that pain in my side before before they even knew that anything was wrong and and he spared me again maybe I wouldn't have been here if I'd gone ahead and developed ovarian cancer because people do die of it you know and he spared my life and then I drove school bus for 30 years and there was many times where God spared me from maybe an accident or getting hurt. And, and I used to drive up to Cascadia, way up to Mountain House. And, and so I was taking some girls home one time and it was a good sunshiny day, no bad weather or anything. And as I went around the corner, then this car came down and was just headed straight, straight right to, to me, right to my front of my bus, you know. And, uh, and all of a sudden, I don't know, God had to have had angels because all of a sudden I looked over to the right hand side and that car had gone straight in front of me and over in the ditch on the side of the bus and didn't even touch me, you know. And uh, I, I know that, that that was God. And so he's, he's, Jesus is there, he's there and, and God sends his angels to protect us, you know. And um, I wanna talk about not just what, 
what he's done for me, which is so many things, but who he is. Jesus is love. You know, he loves us no matter what. And he gives me peace and he gives me comfort and he heals me over and over again and forgiveness because I am so far from being perfect, but God knows. God knows and, and, and you know, he paid the price for my sin on the cross that, that I don't have to be on that cross. I see me hanging on that cross and not Jesus because that's where I deserve to be because of my sins. But he, he was my substitute. He took a part, my part on that cross and, and he paid the price in his grace and that he says he will never leave me nor forsake me. And that what a pr promise, you know, that even to the end of my days that he will be there. And then to think that we will get to live with with Jesus and with God forever and worship him to kneel at his feet and, uh, and just to be with him and be in his presence. I can't imagine anything, anything better. And then Romans 8, 34, it says, he is even at the right hand of God making intercession for me. And so even though Jesus is in heaven right now, sitting at the right hand of God, he's making intercession for me and for you, you know, that when we go through the hard times, he's, he's praying that God will work it out or give us strength to go through it. Uh, like the, the three Hebrew children, that they still went through things and was in the fiery furnace, but Jesus was in there with them. And sometimes when we're going through the hard time, he doesn't always take us out of it, but he goes through it with us and gives us strength. And then again, there are times where he does take us out. He delivers us and we don't have to go through that. And so praise God for that. And then I want to close. I was listening to that, that song that's popular now about God or Jesus being so good, you know, and I, I can't even think of all the words right now offhand, but he says, all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. And that's, that's you know, the, the song that's in my heart, that Jesus has been so, so good all my life, and he will be for the rest of my life. And, and uh, so I just... I just thank him, I praise him, I love him so much. And, and just again, the fact that he knew me from the beginning before I was ever born, and he knew each one of you, and, and he knows our life. And the Bible says that he knows the number of our days even. So, uh, but we need to praise him, we need to worship him and, and, and give him our whole life and nothing else but everything that we have. And I, that's what God has given me for this morning. God bless you. Good evening, good evening, and welcome to our Bible study. Thank you so much for being here. I uh, hope you enjoyed worship and the testimonies. Testimonies are always special. Uh, I actually got to hear my daughters today before, uh, before recording, which was nice to hear her share what Jesus means to her. We'll be calling on most of you to do that. Um, so, uh, and then some things coming up, but we will update you on Friday. Uh, we are here we're in Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8, we looked at the uh, 144,000 last week. Uh, so today we begin chapter 8. So chapter 8, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Father, we thank you today for who you are and for what you do in our lives. Thank you so much for your word, for every jot and tittle. I pray that you minister to us through your word. Uh, use us that we would be uh, a vessel of honor for you. In your precious and holy name amen amen so i know in today's world that pastors wear uh, uh track gear is the new modern theme or one of the themes for uh preaching now i'm not that guy uh, but i would say to you that this jacket was in my office and my green shirt didn't work so i wore green again and so my daughter who's recording me today made me change so here we are in a track jacket ha. moving right along uh revelation chapter 8 revelation chapter 8 beginning with verse 1 uh and uh you know the overview to hear if not go back and record the videos to this point uh, chapter 8 says verse 1 and when he had opened the seventh seal there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour now, I want to talk about that for a second, because if you think about it, up to this point, they were worshiping. They were going crazy. I mean, it was, everyone was engaged in worship. Holy, holy, holy. Every, uh, every human being from every race, 
every creed, every color uh, was there, and they were worshiping. And you can imagine and fathom the noise of that much worship. Even the angels were involved. And then it says, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I, I tried to imagine this week as I was studying, I tried to imagine what that would be like. Uh, I can't go more than a minute, minute and a half without my phone buzzing of some sort. And so I tried to turn everything off and focus for five minutes of complete silence. And it's almost impossible in the world we live. Um, the closest thing that I could relate to that was in the Lost Sea in Sweetwater, Tennessee. There's a place called the Lost Sea and you go underground, you go deep, deep, deep. There's a lake underground. Uh, they call it the Lost Sea. And at one point they go, okay, everybody take hands of someone beside you. And they shut all the lights off and it's dead silent and there's no light whatsoever. And it's the eeriest thing you will ever, ever experience because there's zero light. So there's no reflection of light whatsoever. Uh, and, and everything was silent and it was eerie. Uh, but I picture this because uh, he opens the seventh seal and all of a sudden, whatever begins to happen, and we'll discuss some of that in a minute, but whatever begins to happen takes this full amount of worship. And for the span of half an hour, it goes silent. Imagine something so great that all of heaven was silent for half an hour. And I'm sitting there going, no whispering, nothing. Try it this week. Try to take five minutes somewhere without your phone, without anything, without any noise, complete silence. A pretty intense way to see it, I think. Uh, picture that in your mind and then imagine for 30 minutes. Three minutes is tough, much less 30 minutes. But whatever was getting ready to take place was so enamorating, if you will, that it took their breath away. They were silent in awe. Verse 2. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Uh, who are the seven angels? Who are the seven angels? There's so much... Um, There's that silence again. Um, there's so much theology about who they are. And, and, and let me say this. I know that this is frustrating because I say this to you a lot. But uh, sometimes we spend so much time trying to figure out who they were or who this was or that was or what that means and, and the secret meaning. We miss the true meaning. We miss the forest for the trees. And, and so I would say to you that there are some things uh, some would say that John is identifying the seven spirits of God that we studied in the first few chapters, uh, the seven spirits of God. Uh, some would say it's the archangels, Gabriel, Michael, uh, several others that are named in uh, different books and things like that. Um, others would say that they use the Gnostic Gospels and they take the Gnostic Gospels and they try to um, prepare they try to prepare or to tell you who, uh, and I'm trying to use my words carefully because I don't want to offend too many people, but they give names and ranks through the Gnostic Gospels, the book of Enoch, uh, and, and other books that they use to name these. And, and we must remember that the Gnostic Gospels are the Gospels that were written, uh, you know, hundreds of miles away from where Jesus was, hundreds of years after when Jesus walked the earth, uh, predominantly by people who did not believe in Christ. So they're going to give you some truth and then they're going to mix in some other things. So we want to be careful in those regards, uh, taking those things and running with them because we need to make sure that they do relate to what our scripture says, what God has given us. Uh, Jewish tradition says there are seven angels who stand before God's throne. Uh, John speaking this would certainly let the Jewish people relate to this book of prophecy. So definitely possibility there could be the seven spirits uh, could be the angels to the seven churches we just truly don't know yet uh, so without stretching it 
etc. We're going to move with just what the scripture says. There were seven angels before the throne. And to them were given seven trumpets. Uh, the Old Testament appears each one had a trumpet, and we will most definitely be talking about those trumpets later on. Uh, not right now, but there's seven. They all have a trumpet. There's silence, and each one have a trumpet as they prepare to blow their trumpets. Verse 3. Uh, and another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. Uh, the word golden right there is important, not for tonight. But when we see those things, we need to go back to his history of the Bible or to the Old Testament historically and see when certain things were used. It will give us uh, uh, pretty accurate statements of how things were used. We'll break down a little bit, not of the golden, but a little bit of that tonight. Um, another angel, uh, some say this angel is Jesus. Uh, in the Old Testament, he was uh, an angel of the Lord was referred to. Jesus could have been referred to as an angel of the Lord. Uh, you say, well, Jesus wasn't here yet. I, I understand that. But remember when the king saw four men walking and one of them looked like the son of God. So we have to understand that uh, he was here, even though he wasn't here in the flesh. Uh, the Greek word for another means the same kind. So it could relate definitely to just an angel. Uh, having a golden censer, golden censer. We'll go on for now. Uh, and there was given to him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Uh, it was given to him with much incense. Uh, if, if I was to look at this from a Western mindset, it would pretty much not mean a lot. But if I go back and look at this from a, a Jewish or Hebrew mindset, uh, then let me relate some things to you there. Uh, everything in Scripture goes in an order. Uh, when the Jews were in captivity in Egypt, uh, they, there's timelines in the Bible that, that go specifically seven years, 40 years, 490 years. And when they were in captivity, those timelines would stop until they came out. And then they would start back and be exactly the same. Uh, God always uses timelines. And one of those timelines that he uses, and you've heard me talk about it a million times, is the feast. And so uh, the feast of... Uh, this Sunday is Pentecost. It go, comes or relates to the Feast of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell in the upper room. So uh, I'm not trying to change your mind, but just stating facts. So God allows the feast layout since the beginning of time. So this would relate to atonement and atonement comes after trumpets. So we would leave that there. But if you looked at... Uh, Leviticus 16, which I thought was in my notes. Uh, Leviticus 16, uh, verse 12. Uh, I say uh a lot, don't I? I noticed you did that too. Uh, ha! Leviticus 16, 12 says, He is to take a censer full of burning coals from the altar before the Lord and two hands full of finely ground fragrant incense and take them behind the curtain. He is to put the incense on the fire before the Lord and the smoke of the incense will conceal the atonement cover above the tablets of the covenant law so that he will not die. So we see it as a protection. Uh, it puts a smoke screen, if you will, between uh, the presence of God who came down on the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. The two cherubims is called the mercy seat on top and it's in gold. Uh, imagine that. But the priest, when he came in for atonement, he brought the, the, the blood and the prayers of the people uh, to the altar to ask for forgiveness. Uh, it was called atonement. And so there was this incense that came out of the censer, this burning fire and incense, which related directly to this scripture right here. Let me give you one more. Certainly, again, looking back, if you're from Jewish descent, you could see the Christ or the, uh, the feast or the Old Testament law in this. Uh, the censer as a symbol of protection is also seen in the story of the rebellion of Korah, uh, Dathan and Abram during the wilderness wandering. They have challenged Moses' authority 
gained many followers, and as a result, a deadly plague broke out in the camp. So Moses said to Aaron, take a censer and put fire in it from the altar, put incense on it, and take it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For wrath has gone out from the Lord, the plague has begun. Then Aaron took it as Moses uh, commanded and ran in the midst of the assembly. So he put in the incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living, so the plague was stopped. Uh, that's number 16, 44 through 48. Atonement is always uh, in, in the list of the feast. It comes after the Feast of Trumpets and before it's one of the three fall feasts, and it comes before uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. So we know that this relates to atonement or judgment for sins of the world. Uh, so we see it as a representation of the Day of Atonement. Uh, we can certainly relate it to the Feast of Atonement or what we like to call or what we know as the Tribulation. Uh, is it possible that Jesus is the other angel uh, of the Lord, represented as such, since he is the interceder of our prayers to the Father? Possible, food for thought. Verse four. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hands. The incense and blood was a buffer between God and the priest in the Old Testament. Now we're seeing the exact same image again. Can you see that? This is how... Uh, and I believe that we will celebrate the feast in heaven when we get there. If we make it there, uh, we will celebrate the feast in heaven. Uh, but the reality of that is they're actually painting a picture of, of the same feast going on. Unless, uh, unless when Christ comes and cleanses the earth after the thousand year millennial reign, that there is a dropping of the feast. At this point, I believe we will continue to celebrate those. Uh, the picture is almost an exact image of the Old Testament priest before the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, it, it is it is nailed it, if you will. Uh, let's read on to verse five. Uh, we're not gonna go farther than verse six today, so we're moving rather quickly tonight. Um, we just don't wanna get beyond, we don't wanna start breaking things down we can't finish. Uh, and the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thundering and lightning and an earthquake. Uh, wow. I have read so many commentaries on this and, and so many people's thoughts on this. And, and it really uh, is such a powerful verse, yet it's a verse that we wonder about. Uh, the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. Now, is that for forgiveness? Is that for protection? Excuse me. Or is that for judgment? Uh, Torrance writes it like this, and I'll, I'll read it to you how Torrance writes it. Uh, commentator Torrance. Uh, Significantly, the prayers of God's people set in motion the coming consummation of history. More potent, more powerful, than all the dark and mighty powers let loose in the world. More powerful than anything else is the power of prayer set ablaze by the fire of God and cast upon the earth. Can I read that to you again? Because I think that's a beautiful, beautiful statement. Significantly, the prayers of God's people set in motion the coming consummation of history. More potent, more powerful than all the dark and mighty powers let loose in the world. More powerful than anything else is the power of prayer set ablaze by the fire of God and cast upon the earth. Some say their prayers of protection for those that are still remaining. Others say their prayers of completion or destruction of the tribulation. Uh, Gusick adds some notes here that I will share with you, some scripture. Uh, and again, I'm going to leave this open to you to determine, uh, but I want to talk about those prayers in just a moment, but uh, I'll leave that open to you. It's hot in here with a jacket on, by the way. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12. 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12. 
But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then, now listen to this, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Seeing then that this is coming, that this is coming, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Gusick alludes to that God's people can hasten the coming of the Lord with fervent prayer. Uh, I honestly know some people, and you do too, that fervently pray for God to wait. They're not ready for him to return. They want to live a little bit longer here. And, and then there are those that pray, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus, as in Revelation twenty two twenty, And they pray, uh, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. But it says that we can hasten. So let me explain to you a little bit about how that would work. Obviously, prayer is the greatest part of that, and we want to make sure that our prayers are correct. But he says before that, catch this. What person ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? What kind of person should you be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting the coming of that day. In other words, if we look at it from a different angle, it is to say the, the longer you follow God, the more devout you are the more we're willing to go out and do his will, maybe the more time he gives. Maybe if the world and Christians weren't laxed in the way they live, it would not hasten so quickly the day of the Lord uh, because we, we must understand that atonement or tribulation is judgment. And so... The judgment of the earth is coming. We understand that. We know that by this scripture. But how are we living as born-again children of God? Do we have our heads in the sand? Uh, what is our prayers like? Uh, and I didn't mean to preach here, but I'm just going to preach here for a minute. Uh, too many times I pray my will for God to do. I read scripture so it'll line up with what I want instead of listening to what God has for me to hear. It literally says that the prayers of the saints were so powerful. They were so mighty. And I believe right now that we can pray mighty, powerful prayers. But we need to pray those prayers in accordance to God's will. We need to pray those prayers in accordance to God's will. Daniel prayed in chapter 9 for a speedy return of the Lord. That it would end quickly. That it would be over and done Revelation 20 says, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, even so. Peter writes that, that the day would hasten. And I begin to meditate and think about these things, and I'm thinking, you know what? The prayers are so powerful of God's people, but I think if we're not careful, we pray amiss. We take a verse of Scripture and we apply it to our prayer, uh, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened. Whatever you ask, it will be done but in accordance to his will. If we're not praying prayers in accordance to his will, if we're praying prayers that apply to what we want and not what God would have, then we will be most miserable and we'll actually be fighting against Almighty God. So we want to make sure that we pray the correct prayers because our prayers are powerful and fierce and they are what God would have us do. In fact, as you see, uh, either it rains down fire and protection to those that remain or it rains down the coming of the tribulation and it's the prayer of the saints mixed with the fire of the altar you say how would that be and I really uh, I, I wish I knew more but at the end of the day I could say this to you God is recording your prayers 
and when you are hurt and when you are uh, struggling when things are going on he's recording those and judgment comes and your prayers mean something whether they're answered immediately or whether they wait a season before they're answered so try to remember that uh, one commentator says it like this uh, as God's people pray for the resolution of all things their prayers were touched by the fire from the altar in heaven and then thrown back down to earth all things will not be resolved on this earth until judgment comes uh, all things will not be resolved on this earth till judgment comes and when the prayer of God's people come back to earth they will bring the ground swell of judgment noise thunder lightnings and earthquakes things are beginning to happen here from the prayers of the Saints again let me say it whatever these prayers were they were powerful when mixed with the fires from the altar, glory. When your prayers are mixed with God's will and the power and authority of God, they are an unstoppable force that the enemy cannot come against. Uh, your prayers mean something. Don't pray weak prayers. Pray strong prayers in accordance to God's will. Verse 6, last verse we'll do tonight. I know it's short, but cool. Uh, and the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. We awaited for the seals to be opened, and when the seventh one was opened, the seventh seal was set in motion seven trumpets, depending on how you believe that, that would unleash judgment on the earth. Let me give you some thoughts here. One theory or thought is that these begin simultaneously, that the seals are opening and that the bowls are being poured out and that the trumpets are sounding, and that it's all working together simultaneously. Um, and that John is literally revealing it, showing it in different pictures. Very well could be. Uh, very well could be. The second theory is that they are sequential. That the seals, then the trumpets, then the bowls, uh, and they go in an order. I, I used to believe that more than I do now. I believe now it's a mix of uh, things are happening and John is explaining and he's explaining and he's explaining so many times in the Old Testament if you if you read the book of Genesis um, they'll tell you about the seven days of creation and then go back and break down the things that happened on the seven days of creation some people call that a contradiction I, I just see it as a literary style um, uh, watching old Sherlock Holmes and things uh, would tell you who did it and then tell you why it happened that way uh, different different writers write differently but the style the literary style of the original uh, Hebrew language tended to have poetry to it and so when we see it like this and I know this is written in the Greek but when we see it like this we need to understand and comprehend the rotation of that and how that works and how uh, that he could be literally explaining things that are going on then coming back and explaining things so the timeline is not clear yet so the two theories are one is that it is uh, going along sequentially and the other is that it is simultaneously sequentially or simultaneously uh, you determine but let me say something real quick uh, remember you do not have to have your mind so set so solid that I heard this as a child this is the way it is uh, and this is the only way the ham will ever cook is if you cut the end off of it. Come on, guys, ham will cook with the end on it. Your mom's pot wasn't big enough to put the whole ham in. You know the story. Think about it. When I, when I look at Scripture and I've got it so dead set in my mind that I can't see it differently, God, it's hard for the Holy Spirit to speak to me and change my mind. He has to hit me with a ball bat for that to happen. So when I begin to look at Scripture and go, okay, how does the Holy Spirit want me to see this? Uh, and we talk about this often, but that relates to all scripture. Uh, when you see ask and it shall be given, if you read before that, it says go to your brother if you have fault with him and, and that the Lord will forgive the fault. Ask and it shall be forgiven. We like to take that and apply it to everything. While it does relate to other things in context, that's where it relates. So uh, one of the biggest problems today with Christians uh, myself included, myself included, myself included, is we interpret scripture from a mindset, most often a Western mindset, and how we see things. So in other words, we make it 
line up with our way of thinking. We make scripture line up with our way of thinking. Um, I, I could go here for all night long and tell you things I've heard good godly men and women say that line up with their way of thinking that do not line up with Christ whatsoever. Uh, and while they're good people, they have a mindset that's not going to change. And the only part of our mindset that shouldn't change is that Christ is our Savior, our Redeemer, our Lord. That's the basis, the solid rock that I preached about last Sunday. Everything from there, we need to be able to open our minds up and be able to receive what the Holy Spirit says to us because uh, culture has dictated how we see things and Scripture doesn't line up with culture. There, said it. Uh, see what God says in a situation, even if it doesn't line up with your mindset. Does that make sense? See what God says, even if it doesn't line up with your mindset. Uh, we can read into it whatever we want, but what matter is how God wanted us to see it. Look at Revelation with me, see what it's saying, but not in fear of what's coming. I know people are afraid, but not in fear of what's coming. See, you're missing the mindset that is supposed to be the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ is written and will be fulfilled for one reason and one reason only. That's to point people to Christ. That's to point people to Christ. That's to draw you closer to God. So if I look at this in fear and disgust and don't want to know, then the truth is I, I'm, I'm literally missing an opportunity, a golden opportunity, to see what Christ is trying to speak to me. And at the end of the day, we can see this as atonement. Someone knocking. Sounds like someone's knocking. We can see the power of prayer of the saints, or we can see this as a scary judgment. But think about this, think about this, think about this. What if this whole thing that's about to be poured out, and, and I will share a, a small word from the Lord, I believe, tonight with you at the closing, but this thing that's about to be poured out, if we see that as, oh no, well, what's next? Instead of going, look at the prayer of the saints in this. Look at the power of the prayer of the saints. I want my prayer life to be better. What about in 2 Peter when he says, Walk in holiness and God newness. Let your conversation be those things. And all of a sudden I begin to look and meditate and I'm like, this isn't about the return of the Lord as much as how close am I to him. This is an opportunity, a golden opportunity for me to look at scripture to help me draw closer to him. And that's the nutshell of this thing is to draw people to Christ. So uh, we will stop there for tonight and we will close in prayer. Before we pray, let me do this. Uh, this is what I believe the Lord spoke to me uh, and let me make it clear there is a million a million people prophesying out there so this isn't a prophecy this is just what I believe he spoke to me the end is near but not yet tell them to get their houses in order the end is near but not yet uh, I didn't take it as a fear that tomorrow's the last day I took it as a opportunity to get our houses in order and I feel like when I was studying this week that's what was spoken to me by the Holy Spirit uh, if I missed it I missed it because I know there's a, again a million prophecies of of when I know there was several that coronavirus would disappear from the earth in 40 days uh, I, I know there's there's a million prophecies out there uh, and I never professed to be a prophet but I would say that I believe the Lord spoke to me and said uh, the end is near but not yet Tell them to get their houses in order. Tell them to be about the Father's business. So there's a golden opportunity for God's people to draw closer to him. And there's a golden opportunity for those that do not know him to know him as Lord and Savior. Hey, exciting times. We'll start with Revelation chapter 8, verse 7. Uh, tomorrow night, Micah will give his testimony and share uh, online. And then Friday night will be... Uh, Revelation, no, relevant, okay, Mark Scott, and I will be sitting down with him, you don't want to miss it, we'll be talking about some things uh, with his up and coming ministry, so we love you, let me bless you, Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your word, uh, Lord, I pray that you give me strength and wisdom 
to learn and grow and to draw closer to you. Help me to be what you've called me to be and help your people to be closer to you. For those that don't know you, I pray that they would know you as Lord and Savior. God, I ask you to minister to us and through us. Uh, meet the needs of your people in your precious name. Amen. How long is it? <laughs>